Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Steve Willis, co-founder of Hope Sheds Light. On behalf of my partners, uh, Arvo Prima and Ron Rosetto, I welcome you to our Finding Hope for Life family support meeting. It's always such a joy for me to be with you and to, to, you know, to share this night. It gets me excited, it gets me uh, energized, and we thank all of our Facebook friends who, who are joining us tonight. Um, you all know about our walk, right? Celebration of Hope Walk, the sixth one, is September 7th. If you haven't signed up yet, please do. It's going to be a rocking good time. Right? For those of you who are new, let me introduce Hope. Hope is a nonprofit, a family focused nonprofit agency. Our mission is to raise awareness and educate individuals and families in the community about the impact of addiction by having the courage to share our personal experiences by sharing our wisdom and our strength, and by sharing hope and resources that lead to the long-term recovery of the whole family. What we want to do is to remove the fear and the stigma that's attached to this disease by offering a loving and safe and hopeful environment that allows families to heal and bring wellness to the community. And we do that by this meeting that we have tonight. This is this Finding Hope meeting is held on the second and fourth Tuesday of every month in this beautiful Holy Cross Lutheran Church. On the first and third Tuesdays of each month, we, we have our Finding Recovery for Life meetings that meet at, the, at our Hope Sheds Life office, which is at 253 Chestnut Street. That's a little different format. That's a, that's a group learning uh, type of approach where we introduce topics of recovery. The idea is to help everybody cultivate good recovery practices in the family. Um, all these weekly meetings are open to anyone that's impacted by addiction. Our prayer is that by us sharing with you and you with us, you will find the courage to change the way you think and feel about addiction and in turn become healthy. Um, the format tonight, we begin with an educational piece. We are really blessed every other week to have wonderful, talented um, colleagues from the field to join us uh, to talk about aspects of prevention, treatment, and recovery. Um, and then after that, we break out into groups to talk about what we've heard, to share the impact that addiction and substance abuse has had on our lives, and importantly, to talk about what we can do as individuals, as family members, to get well. Because we all have to recover. We're on our own paths, and we want to help you get there. So thank you for letting us share with you. It's really our blessing to do this. And with that, let me introduce our speaker tonight. He's really very special. I've known Lisa for a while. This is Lisa Cordasco. And she is the clinical director of Enlightened Solutions, which is a very, very great program. It's down in Atlanta County. And uh, again, we're blessed to have Lisa here with us. So please welcome Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. having me. Um, it's really a wonderful thing to be able to come out and to see all of you here. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction, Steve. I've known Steve for a very long time now, and I am such a fan and admirer of everything that, um, that Hope Sheds Light has been doing for this community. Um, you know, when I came in, I shared with Steve that uh, there are a couple people in my, in my personal life that um, you know, that hope has really made a significant difference for, um, and that they owe the success that they're having today in recovery to that, that support that's been offered here. Um, so again, it's really a blessing to be able to come here and, and share with all of you. Um, so my topic for this evening is the 12 step process. Um, and so I'll tell you guys a little bit first about, about myself and about how you know, I kind of relate to that topic. Um, so, as Steve mentioned, I'm the clinical director of a treatment program called Enlightened Solutions. Um, I've been working in the substance abuse field for probably about seven years now. Um, I'm an LCSW, which is a licensed clinical social worker. I'm also a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor. Um, I also specialize in, uh, in co-occurring trauma and addiction. So, um, so as a professional, 
you know, I've had a lot of experience with, with addiction and, and treatment and 12 steps and lots of different modalities. Um, and so when I was preparing for this topic tonight, I was kind of thinking about, okay, do I come from that angle as, you know, this, this professional in the field? But if I just shared with you all from, from that side of it, I would only be sharing half of who I am. Um, I'm also a person in long-term recovery. Um, I have been in recovery since October 5th, 2006. And so being a person in long-term recovery, that, what that means is that I haven't taken a drink or a drug in over 12 years. And, and for somebody who comes from where I came from, that is nothing short of a miracle, an absolute miracle. Because there was a time in my life when I didn't think I could get a single day. Um, you know, so, so I've seen these different angles of, of addiction, of substance use, of treatment, of recovery. Um, and I've also been the loved one as well. So for many of you here, you know, I can, I can empathize um, with the, the struggle that comes with the powerlessness of watching somebody else struggle with their addiction um, and finding that path to recovery. So, you know, the first thing I want to say with that is just stigma is still out there and stigma is so alive. Um, I'm very grateful for the setting that I work in today and the support that I have in my life. There's times when I forget that, you know. Um, so when, when Steve was uh, introducing and he made kind of that, uh, that reference to a big part of what all this and everybody coming here together is about is reducing that stigma, it made me reflect on that. Um, you know, and there was a time early on in my career in the behavioral health field where I would have never dreamed of standing in front of a room full of people and you know, in a live social media feed and saying, yeah, I'm a person in recovery um, because there was so much stigma and because you know, I heard other professionals use you know, some really awful, hurtful, pejorative language. Um, and this is in you know, behavioral health. So, uh, so stigma is still very real and, um, and it's still out there. And so I commend everybody for, for being here and taking a stance against that. Um, and I'm grateful for being able to be here with you and to share, um, you know, hey, recovery is possible. And, uh, and I'm evidence of that. And everybody in this room is evidence of that. You know, and so together we can, we can try to combat that, um, you know, so that people don't have to continue to face that. Um, so that's kind of the first thing. It's just, you know, being able to be here and acknowledge who I am is, um, is a really wonderful thing and that, that we have the supports to be able to do so. Um, one of the other things that, you know, when I was thinking about what it was that I wanted to speak on tonight and kind of having this debate with myself of do I come from the professional point of view, do I come from the person recovery point of view, um, I was thinking about how, you know, those things aren't mutually exclusive. And, um, and there's been plenty of times when, when I've seen on both sides of it, some of that kind of almost territorial argumentative thing that can happen. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that or experienced that before where you know, people can be very rigid in their thinking and it's, well, it's just the medical model or it's just you know, this particular way of treatment or it's just 12 step program and that's the only way. Um, and I think what's so important to mention is that Recovery has to happen in an atmosphere of acceptance, support, tolerance, um, love, and understanding that there are many paths. There are many paths and that recovery is not something that is cookie cutter. You know, everybody's recovery has to be something that's so personal and so their own um, that I don't think any of us can say, well, you know, this is the one way that you have to do this, or this is the one way that you have to do this. Um, you know, so it's so important that we all kind of come together and say, okay, you know, what's going to work for you? Right? Whatever that might be. If that's treatment, if that's meeting, if that's, you know, one, one form of spirituality or another form of spirituality or some type of support community here or there, whatever's going to work for that person 
so long as it helps them to recover and to get better and to live, then you know, then that's then that's what we got to do. Um, I was uh, I was looking on on social media last night and I saw somebody had posted um, just like a cute little article about um, Steven Tyler Aerosmith had like celebrated seven years I guess recently and he kind of had this little article about it and uh, and it was very nice and it was really hopeful and um, you know like any good addict I had to scroll to the bottom to take a look at the comments to see like what kind of debate and uh, and thing was going on there and um, and there was one comment that had really struck me in particular and stood out um, because this, you know, this gentleman had gone on this whole rant, and it didn't even say in the article that um, that you know Stephen Tyler was a 12-step member. It made some kind of vague references, but this gentleman had gone on this whole rant about you know how people are dying because everybody's shoving 12-step down their throat, and you know statistics say that that's not effective, and this and that, and and I was so saddened. Um, by the fact that this person clearly had such a really negative experience, you know, that it led to this intense resentment for them that here was this beautiful article talking about the hope of somebody being able to change their life and they had to kind of go and and, uh, and use it as a platform and an opportunity to, to punch holes and poke jabs, you know, and so again, it's really about helping people to find what is that path that's going to work for them. Um, you know, and 12-step is it's just one of those many paths. You know? um, so one thing that I will say is, you know, anything that I speak about tonight related to uh, the 12-step process or 12-step model um, is my own personal experience, okay? I'm not here as a representative for any particular 12-step um, fellowship or community or program um, just with respect to their principles around anonymity. Um, you know, and that's something that's really valued. So I can only kind of speak from my experience. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of times when when I have clients that are struggling with their willingness for um, that twelve step process, I like to talk about with them and kind of break down. Well, what is what is kind of that combination that has to occur in order for recovery to happen? What what does recovery mean? What do we need in order to recover? Um, and the things that I've kind of come up with as being, for me, the criteria of what it takes to recover would be, um, would be kind of four different criteria. And so this is kind of, this is my little spiel that I give to my clients that are like, I don't want to do 12 step. You know, that's awful. I'm not going to those meetings. They're a cult. You know, you can't make me like, okay, that's fine. If you don't want to do that, cool. But let's talk about what things you're going to need in place in order to recover, in order to work on yourself, in order to grow, in order to stop acting on these maladaptive behaviors that you've been acting on and do something else instead. Um, so the first kind of criteria that I've come up with for that is some kind of introspection, self-awareness. And that's, that's really what the 12 steps kind of break down. Um, me getting to know me, right? Being able to reflect on that. Um, and gain insight into that and awareness of that and start to be able to look at the things that I want to change. Now there's other ways that people can practice that introspection and practice that self-awareness. Therapy, I mean that's one of them, right? Um, so that's kind of that first thing is some kind of ability to take a look in the mirror, which is uh, pretty uncomfortable, right? not something that most of us really want to do, but, but if we want to get better, that's something we have to do. We can't get better until we really take that hard look in that mirror and start to kind of dig into, okay, what, what's going on here? What makes me tick? Why do I behave these, this way? What are these patterns that are happening for me and what can I start to do about it? The second um, kind of criteria for, for recovery that I would say would be um, support. So you guys all have that right here, you know, and, and that's wonderful. So uh, a community of people, a network of people that you feel like you can go to and you can be honest with, and that's, that's crucial. People that you can turn to, you can share whatever insane thoughts are going on in your
your head at that time and just kind of um, kind of let that vent on them and know that they're going to be there for you and they're going to support you and they're going to be able to empathize with you and there's not going to be that fear of judgment. Uh, the third criteria would be some kind of spirituality, if you're not comfortable with the word spirituality, um, values, purpose, you know, kind of a code for what are the things that you want to be about, and what are the things that you want to live by, and what gives you that sense of connection, purpose, fulfillment. And then the fourth criteria for me would be service, giving back. So if we buy into kind of that whole idea that uh, a big part of addiction is the self-centeredness, right, then a really important part of recovering from that is being able to be of service to others, being able to give back. And in turn, that builds this amazing sense of self-efficacy. Because for so many of us, you know, when, when we first enter this journey into recovery, there's so much shame and so much guilt and so much belief that, wow, you know, all I can do is cause pain and destruction. I'm, I'm no good to anybody here. You know, I can't, I can't possibly make a positive impact in this world. And so by putting that into action, we get to kind of disprove those theories that we have in our mind. So that's, that's kind of my little, um, like I said, my little spiel that I give to people when they're like, I don't want to do 12 step. That's not for me. Okay, well, how are we going to meet these criteria? Because if you don't want to do 12 step, that's fine. But we got to figure out a way that you're going to meet these criteria. And the nice thing about the 12 step programs is they give it to you in this nice, neat little package. You don't have to go to all these different places to find those criteria. It's kind of all right there waiting for you. Um, you know, one of the other things I think that's important too is um, like that self awareness. Again, and going back to that. Okay, so. So the 12 step process, and I, I don't know who picked the, the title of that or the topic of it, but, um, but I love the word process because for me, I think about journey um, and that's exactly what this is. You know, um, we come in and so many times we want things to just be better. We want to be able to, to break out that magic wand and to just fix it and um, for everything to be okay or everything to kind of just go back to how it was or to kind of pretend that, um, that all this wreckage didn't happen and it doesn't work that way. It's a process, it's a journey, it's gonna take some time, it's gonna take some work. Um, you know, and so, so the 12 step process, it really is this, this journey. Um, and so it starts with, you know, with that criteria and going in and, and asking for help first and foremost. So I'll give you guys kind of, um, I guess, a little breakdown about 12 steps and, and what that journey is and what that process looks like. Um, one of the key kind of principles to that process is, is the word we. Okay, so again, support, community. Um, we can't do any of this on our own, right? So, you know, you all know that. That's why you're sitting here because I'm sure that many of you have tried time and time and time again to figure out a solution or a way around or you know, some way to get through this on your own and found that, well, that just wasn't possible. Right? So instead we have to reach out for support and for help. And, um, and so that's one of the most important kind of uh, premises of like that 12 step process and that journey knowing that that journey doesn't happen alone. It's always a we process. So that's where sponsorship comes in. Um, and so, you know, people will be given the recommendation to get a sponsor, to find somebody else in recovery, and really, you know, that's just somebody else who's walked that path before and is willing to say, hey, come on, I'll walk with you. And they're not a professional, and, you know, they don't have to have any credentialing or criteria or anything. And, and sometimes that can be, I think, a little bit, um, concerning maybe to families. I don't know if that's been the case for anybody where you're kind of like, well, you know, trusting this other person and well, what, what kind of criteria they have to be able to do that. And that's where it's just, you know, our experience becomes our greatest asset. You know? and, and so again, you know, I reflect for me on those early years when, when I had to keep my anonymity close and I, and I didn't, um, 
disclose the fact that I was a person in recovery. I was selling myself and the people I was working with and the environment and community I was working with short because today that past is my greatest asset. And so that's where that whole we process comes in. The past becomes that best asset in order to help somebody else grow and change. Um, and so it starts with that first step admission. So we all know what's our favorite word in that first step. Powerless, right? How many of you guys like cringe at that word? Does anybody have that reaction? No? I heard a couple little chuckles, right? Yeah, I know, I know for me, I certainly did initially. Surrender is even worse. Yeah, right? You're telling me powerless, surrender, right? These really, really heavy words in that first step, they kind of like hit you, doesn't it? Oh my gosh, I have to surrender. Well, what does that mean? I, I have to admit that I'm powerless. Well, what does that mean? You know, and uh, if any of you guys are control freaks like me, it's a really scary thing. I love to be in control, but control is really just an illusion and that's what my first step teaches me. The only thing in this, this world that I have a level of control or choice in is how I react to things, my actions and my reactions. And so that's what that first step gives me that foundation of. One of the things that I think um, is important to kind of mention in that is the wording. We admitted that we were powerless. So what does that mean? Were is past tense. You know, and this is something that people can kind of get confused with. So am I powerless? Am I not powerless? Was I powerless? Powerless now? Right? And, um, and so what that means is that today, right? So right now, today, I'm clean. Today, I didn't take any mind or mood altering substances. So today, I get to make some choices about my actions and my reactions. Now, if tomorrow I wake up and I take a drink or a drug, whew, all bets are off on that. I don't get to make those choices anymore. I don't get to be in control of my behavior and my life anymore. And so that's, and that's what that means. So today I don't have to become powerless if I choose to apply recovery in my life. If I choose to use my people who are supports, if I choose to be honest with them and say to somebody, hey, you know, I had this really messed up thought or, you know, I had a really bad dream last night or today I'm just, I'm feeling kind of funky and I want to act out. I don't have to become powerless. And so that's that freedom that it gives. But that whole idea of surrender, yeah, that's really scary. So again, the we, I need help. I can't do this alone. If I try to go out there and I try to tackle addiction and try to solve this horrific problem all on my own, I'm getting into the ring with a monster. You know, there's no hope at that. And so then after I've come to that admission, right, then what? Okay, so now I've admitted that I'm powerless. Now what do I do with that? You know, and, and the 12 step programs are based on a spiritual guide, right? So when people get to that second step and they see that word higher power, that can be something too. That's, well, what does that mean? Does that mean that I have to ascribe to a certain religious belief or spiritual belief or that I have to convert to this or to that? No. no. So spiritual does not mean religious. Spiritual is whatever you want that to mean. And now, you know, a lot of times people do have very strong reactions to some of the language that's used in, in 12 steps. And if you look at the history of the 12-step programs, yeah, so there are a lot of Judeo-Christian undertones, there certainly are, but that's because if you look at the time period when it was formulated, and you look at the history behind that, well, that makes sense, because that's what there was, right? But it states very clearly, um, you know, for, for the 12-step programs, that it's, it's not religious, it is spiritual, and so it's coming to find, well, what is that something greater for you? Um, I was somebody who struggled very much with the whole spiritual concept. I had a lot of fears about that. I had a lot of um, old beliefs that just really didn't work for me anymore. And, um, and thankfully, I had a lot of people in my life that were able to guide me and say, well, we'll figure out what works for you. And, uh, and the first thing that I was able to really connect to about something greater than me, something more powerful than me, was the ocean. Any of you guys ever been like really like tumbled around in a wave? 
like couldn't tell the surface from the bottom and you just got absolutely destroyed in a wave? Yeah, I hope I'm not the only one. Okay, okay so for me, that was the first thing that I could really think of and connect to like, wow, that's, that's a power greater than me, right? Like that's something that try as much as I would like to, you know, that's something that's so much more powerful than me. So that was the first way that I was able to kind of connect to it. And, and for me, my experience is that that belief grew and grew and grew the more action that I put into it. Okay. The other part of that second step is the whole like insanity piece, you know, acknowledgement of the fact that the way I was behaving before was absolutely insane. And then on any given day, my thinking can be absolutely insane. And that can be a tough pill to swallow, you know, for, for a lot of us. Well, what do you mean insane? You know, I'm not, not crazy, am I? Like, well, Paul, if I acted this way because of this, this, and this. And you would act insane too, right? Um, but the definition that, that uh, the Tulsa programs use for insanity is repeating the same thing again and again and expecting a different result. So how many of us have done that, right? Especially with our loved ones too sit down, we have that same conversation, we set those same boundaries, we go back on them again and again and again, and we expect that it's gonna turn out differently, and then we're left sitting there like, oh, I don't understand what happened. You know, how did this happen again? It's like, well, if I do the same thing, and I expect it's gonna work out differently, yeah, it's not gonna. You know, so that admission of like, wow, you know, the ways that I was behaving and the thought process that I was using was insane. Um, and the thing that can help me with that is whatever this something greater than me is. It can help give me relief, help restore me to sanity. Okay, so then we kind of lead into our third step. Turning it over. Right? That's really scary too, isn't it? It's about as scary as surrender. Um, putting trust in something outside of myself. Again, I told you guys, I'm a control freak. Right? He asked me to put trust faith and, and make a decision to put my, my will and my life in the care of something else, yeah, that's pretty scary. It is, it's pretty scary, but then for me, when I had the experience of doing that, the relief of doing that, that kind of opened up a whole other world, right? And I don't know if anybody's been able to have that experience of getting to that place where that pain is great enough and making that decision to turn it over and like this 10,000 pound weight getting lifted. I see you kind of nodding your head there. Like, yeah. Yeah. And that's this incredible gift and this incredible freedom when we can finally allow ourselves to do that. And that too, 24 hours, daily reprieve. So for one day, I can be completely in it and I can turn it over absolutely have this sense of faith, right? And then the next day, I can get all consumed by that fear and that need to control and that same thought process. Uh, so it's a daily practice. So that one, two, three, that's what we kind of call like the foundation. That's that beginning. And, and if we don't have that, if we don't have that strong foundation, none of the rest of it can happen, right? And so, uh, you know, people say a lot of times the steps are in order for a reason. How many people have experienced um, what's everybody's like favorite step to kind of jump to? Like right after we get five seconds clean and we get out of treatment, what do we run home to you guys and do? Come on, you guys know, right? Amends, right? How many of you guys have had that experience? Your loved one, you know, I've got five days clean and they just kind of vomit all this stuff on you. I'm so sorry and everything's gonna be different and I've changed now and yeah. And it's like, whoa, hold up a minute. Yeah, that's, we're not there yet. Because how can, I, how can I try to make amends to you when I haven't even gotten with the first step? When I haven't even gotten with any change? Can't happen. Because amends isn't about saying sorry, it's about change, we'll get to that one. So that one, two, three, that foundation, we've got to have that. We've got to have that before anything else. You know, think about, right, so foundation, if you're building a house, you build the house on a, fa a faulty foundation, it's going to collapse. Especially because what we start to go into after that. So the dreaded fourth step. How many of you guys have um, 
experienced fear or heard other people express fear about the fourth step. Yeah. Oh my God, the fourth step. Ah. Right? It's like this terrifying thing and you hear people talking about, oh, I'm on my fourth step. <sighs> really rough, I'm on that fourth step. You know, oh, I'm so terrified of that fourth step. And it's like, wow, you know, what are we so afraid of? So it's, it's asking us to take a fearless and searching moral inventory, to take an inventory Behavior, and I am looking in that mirror. Right? It's uncomfortable. And yeah, it is scary for a lot of people to have to, to hold that mirror up and really take a look at all these things that have happened up to this point. And so, you know, what's the point of that? Why do we do that with people? It seems, you know, it seems a little like cruel, doesn't it? Like, ooh, make somebody look at their past and break it all down. But what's the purpose of it? If I can't gain insight and I don't understand my past patterns, how can I possibly change what I'm doing today? How can I possibly change what I'm going to do in the future? I can't. I have to be able to first have an understanding of that. And it's not, it's not to live in shame. It's not to you know, beat myself over the head with that baseball bat. That's not the purpose of it. The purpose of it is to gain an understanding start to identify some patterns, to really start to, again, take that look at me. Well, why do I function that way? Why is it every time that, you know, I've been in a relationship, I seem to act out in this kind of way, or the same thing seems to happen? Like, what's that common denominator in all that? Ah, uh, it's me. So what's going on here, and how do I start to dissect that? And so that's really the purpose of it, you know, starting to gain that understanding, and then as we move into five and sharing it with another person and also with whatever that higher power is that we've come to understand and getting to what that exact nature is right so again it's not about it's not about the shame it's not really about rehashing the details of it it's starting to identify well what what is this about for me you know where does this come from and what can i start to do about it so if i can own it right and i can kind of name it and i can say okay this is what this is then that means that I start to have the ability to do something differently with it. And, and for many people, again, like that admission of those things to another human being is really scary. Who loves vulnerability? Anybody? Yeah, I don't think so. And that was too, it was like human beings, we hear like vulnerability and that kind of stuff and we're like, ah, no, please anything but that. It was kind of like built into us, it's this protective thing. So the idea of sitting down with another human being, kind of like bearing our soul, that's really vulnerable, that's really scary, that takes a level of, of trust, doesn't it? You know? And again, that's where, okay, that sense of support, that sense of we, that sense of empathy, having somebody else that I can turn to and I can allow myself to be vulnerable with. And I know that maybe even if they haven't gone through those exact same things, they can understand. And they can say, yeah, I understand what you're feeling right now. I felt that feeling too, right? And so then we start to get into like a little bit of that relief, so six and seven. So we start to notice what those character defects are that are feeding those patterns of behavior. And as we start to understand what those character defects are, we look again to that relationship with that higher power to start to help us with that. And that doesn't mean that this like lightning bolt comes down from the sky and all of a sudden relieves us of our defects and we become these perfect human beings. That'd be really cool if that's what happened, but it's not. Instead, it's again about, I can start to make a choice about my behavior, okay? So um, for me, one of the ways that my defect of anger would show up in my early recovery was road rage. Can get that one either. I'm gonna like just get real fired up behind that wheel, you know. And <laughs> and it wasn't it wasn't that 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 defect just magically went away, right? But what started to happen for me is I would have a little bit of awareness when the impulse to act on it was starting to build, and I would get this tiny little space of time in between where it was like, ooh, I see myself coming, and. What am I going to do? Am I going to take a deep breath? Am I going to maybe ask my higher power for help? Am 
going to maybe call somebody? Am I going to practice some of the skills that I've learned? Or am I going to go ahead and act on it? And that's, you know, that's something I get to decide in that moment. Get that brief little reprieve. Okay, which way are we going to go here? Are we going to practice the new things that we're learning? Or are we going to rely on that old pattern of behavior? And listen, there are some times when it's, yep, I'm going for it. I'm going to act on that defect. I'm going to act on that shortcoming. And there's other times that start to become greater and greater and greater where, okay, I can take that pause and I can take that space and I can do something differently. Right? And so maybe some of you guys have experienced that for those of you that have some experience with this kind of process of, you know, that loved one, right, is standing across from you <laughs> and you know, you know what's going on. You know they're under the influence and you can that defect coming up. I want to act on it. I want to have that same argument with them that I've had a million times before. I want to be in that insanity. Or maybe I get that little reprieve. Maybe I get that just little bit of space where I can choose to apply some of these things that I've been working on and that I've been learning. And I can do something differently. I can't guarantee that they're going to do something differently. But I can. And so then as we start to to gain some healing from this and we start to actually change a little bit, that's when we kind of get into this place where we can clean up some of that wreckage of that past behavior. And that's where those amends come in. And so like I said before, amends is not about saying I'm sorry. I mean, I'm sure many of you are sick of hearing those words. I'm sorry, 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 I'm sorry right? So if you look up amends in the dictionary, to make a necessary change. You know, if you think about like an amendment, like amendment to the Constitution, you know, you don't say I'm sorry to the Constitution. Instead you make a necessary change to it. So that's what amends is. It's not about saying I'm sorry. It's not about you know, making those apologies. It's about am I changing that behavior? You know, and so how do I do that? And sometimes it's through making that direct amends and that acknowledgement of, hey, you know, I hurt you. Here's how I want to make this right, and asking you, well, how can I make this right? And there's other times when maybe it's indirect. My uh, my mother-in-law used to tease my husband all the time, who's who's also in recovery, about like, can't wait till you get to that ninth step. She was like waiting for it. She's like, I can't wait till you get to that ninth step. I can't wait to hear it. You know, but um, but the longer he stayed in that journey and in that process, there was so much of that amends that was unspoken and was indirect and that was the stuff that was so powerful you know and for me too like those indirect amends are the things that are so powerful being able to to be present and have a different relationship and again respond differently to show up instead of to run away and disappear when things got difficult right and to be able to be the support instead of always taking 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 being able to give And so after we started to clean up that wreckage of her past, then we get into this maintenance phase and it's, and it's about just kind of like, okay, so I've cleaned up the past, I've got an understanding of what those patterns of behavior are, I'm doing a good job with not acting out on them for the most part, right, because we're not perfect. And, and so now it's just about like maintaining that change and continuing to grow and continuing to move forward. Um, and so we do a daily inventory and, you know, and that's as simple as, okay, what am I doing? What am I doing today for my recovery? What am I doing today to continue to be in that solution? You know, are there things that maybe I need to take accountability today? Did I act on the road rage? You know, do I need to take a look at that? Did I snap at somebody and maybe I owe them an amends and I gotta kinda clean that up and not wait until years later to clean it up, but handle it right then and now. You know, be able to go in and say, hey, you know, I was wrong. How can I change this? I do to fix it. Yeah. And, and acknowledging that my recovery is my accountability every day, right? So that's one of the big things. 24 hours. That's all we get. I can't promise anybody that I'm going to be clean forever. I can't promise that. You don't know that. I can promise you guys I'm going to stay clean for today. And I can hold myself accountable to that inventory and to living in recovery today and doing everything that I possibly can to continue to grow today. 
And so then we get into that 11th step where we talk about a spiritual awakening, which sounds really cool, right? And um, people have very different experiences with that spiritual awakening. So I remember when I first heard that word, I thought, you know, again, because I'm kind of a dramatic person, I thought that it was going to be this like, ah, right? Like the angels would come out of here somewhere and say, there would be this like great light and all this kind of stuff. And I've heard all kinds of really interesting stories where people have had these very intense like spiritual awakenings. Eh, for me, I can't say that I have any burning bush or angels popping out moments. Um, but I've certainly had a spiritual awakening. You know, and, and for many people, that's something that happens really subtly and really gradually. You know, and, uh, and again, what it talks about is that it's a result of that work that we put into it. So if I want to have that spiritual relief, if I want to have that sense of spiritual wholeness and fulfillness, well, I have to put some work into that. It's not going to just magically happen. There's not going to be a fairy with a magical wand that pops out and, and kind of does that for me. I have to put action to it, like any relationship. You know? So if I look at the relationship with, again, my belief, the higher power of my understanding, whatever you all choose to call, to call it, God, Allah, whatever, whatever works for you. Um, but like, if it's the same as any other relationship, it takes work, it takes action. I have to do something to cultivate that. You can't expect that it's just gonna kinda happen on its own. You know? and so the 11th step is really about that process, like cultivating that relationship in order to have that spiritual awakening. And really like building that. Um, and then 12th step, being able to give it back as a result the result of that whole process, having that spiritual awakening, and being able to then in turn pass that experience and that growth and that recovery on to somebody else and to be of service and to be the person now that's saying, hey, come on, I'll walk with you. We can walk on this path together. You know, and again, like I said before, that, that whole idea of service and giving back is so huge because for so many of us, there's this, you know, this sense of brokenness, you know, of, well, I can't, I can't be of any good to anybody. You know, I can't, I can't possibly benefit another person or do good in this world. Oh my gosh, I've, you know, I've caused so much harm and I've caused so much wreckage and I'm this terrible, awful human being, right? And so maybe it's just something small, like being of service to somebody else, being there to give somebody else a, a hug and a kind word, you know, being able to have commitment at a 12-step meeting and be the person that, you know, puts the coffee pot on or sets the chairs up or whatever. It gives that sense of, ooh, hey, I guess I can do something positive. You know, I guess I can make a positive impact on community, on others, you know, and then starting to build that sense of, like, continued, like, self-efficacy. All right, maybe I'm worth something. And so it really is this incredible journey, right? And, um, and so it's not that journey and that 12-step process, that's not just for the addict. Right? That's, that's for all of us. Um, you know, it's funny, when I went through a, a period of time in my recovery where I was really struggling with, um, you know, with a loved one's addiction and being on the other side of it, I had been given the suggestion to go to one of the 12-step programs, you know, that's for, for families. And, um, and I went in with this expectation that, like, okay, we're going to talk about them, right? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I found out that wasn't the case. Oh, okay. You guys in here are doing the same thing that I'm doing over there. We're recognizing that we can only work on ourselves, and we can only change what's going on in here. We can't change anybody else. I don't have control over the things outside of me just get to make some choices about the way that I'm going to live, you know, so the 12-step process is really, it's that, it's a design for living, right? it's a design for living, it's kind of, it gives us this road map, you know, because, listen, control freak, like I said, but when I try to fix, manage, and control my own life, it doesn't work out so well. 
know, and so when I follow this roadmap that these other people who have this experience and have walked this path before me have laid out, oh, guess what? Things get a lot better. They get a lot smoother. I don't have to continue to live in that same cycle and that same insanity and come up against those same barriers again and again and again and again and again. So, um, but again, it all starts with, with that we and with allowing other people to do that and to help me to walk that journey with me. And so again, I, you know, I commend all of you guys for, for being here and for being on this journey. Um, and hopefully something in what I've said is helpful in that journey and if it's not don't worry because there'll be a, another speaker next time too you know and, uh, and just just keep on allowing yourself to be open to to those messages and to that support and to that help and to that solution because you know there really is um, there's so much hope out there and there is the potential for so much help out there you know it it, uh, it warms my heart and my spirit to see people coming together and really really fighting against this thing because um, you know, it's bad out there. I don't have to tell you guys that, but it's, it's bad out there. Um, but we get to choose to do something about that. Yeah, just for today, right? Um, so one of the things I did want to mention before I shut it down, um, so you guys have, have great support here, um, and especially if there's any people watching at home that are further down in the Atlantic County area, um, we do have uh, a support group at Enlightened Solutions, that's the last Thursday of every month, so that's coming up um, pretty soon, I think it's on the 29th is our next one. Last Thursday of every month at 7 p.m. at the Enlightened Solutions building, 600 South Odessa Avenue in Egg Harbor City. Um, and it's, it's open to the public, it's you know, a pretty laid back form, and really just another opportunity for anybody that may be down um, in that area, any family members or loved ones in order to get some some support that's you know it's free, open to everybody, and, uh, and that's it. If you guys have any questions, I would. I don't know if we have time for that. Yeah. Okay, great. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, guys, for having me out here and allowing me to share with you.